Hi, my name's Tom Pollack. I'm a psychiatrist. I work in South London with a special interest in neuropsychiatry. I'm also a researcher at King's College London. And today I'm going to talk about the role that psychiatry and in particular neuropsychiatry has in supporting people with encephalitis and their carers. So, uh, what is neuropsychiatry? Well, neuropsychiatry is a branch of psychiatry uh, and that's different from psychology. Psychiatry is a branch of medicine. We have the same training as uh, any other areas of medicine, so neurology, neurosurgery, paediatrics, it's just that the specialist training is a little bit different. And neuropsychiatry is involved with people who have neurological disorders, but who also have mental health difficulties or needs as well. So the kinds of neurological disorders that we see are epilepsy, neurodegenerative disorders like dementia, brain injury, movement disorders like Parkinson's disease, and of course we see people with encephalitis. And when we talk about mental health problems, really this constitutes emotional problems, problems with behavior that can be distressing for patients or their families, and also problems with thinking. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the role of the neuropsychiatrist in supporting people with encephalitis at different stages of the journey uh, that someone with encephalitis will go through. At the very earliest stages, what's the role of a psychiatrist in recognizing those early symptoms of encephalitis and potentially avoiding uh, misdiagnosis. Um, the acute management of encephalitis when a patient is in hospital um, and is being treated by perhaps the general medical or the neurological team. And also an area that I'm really passionate about, which is what happens when a patient is discharged from hospital and they go back to their normal life. So I think this is a period where mental health problems can arise and psychiatry has a really important role. So one of the questions that patients often ask me is, well, why am I seeing a psychiatrist? I have a neurological problem. I don't have a mental health problem. Um, and in answer to that, I often say, well, actually, the mind and the brain, they both live in the same box. So of course, something like encephalitis, which can affect the brain so profoundly, is bound to impact the mind and bound to cause these emotional symptoms, these behavioral symptoms, and these problems with thinking. And after all, in our lifetimes, one in four of us will experience mental health problems. And it's important to remember that encephalitis doesn't discriminate. It can affect people who already have mental health problems or people who are more vulnerable to have mental health problems just as much as it can affect people who don't. So people often talk about encephalitis as a hidden disability. And when it comes to mental health symptoms, I think this is perhaps even more true. But even if you can't see mental health symptoms on a brain scan, for example, that doesn't make them any less real. And there's a real problem that uh, we face with stigma around psychiatric symptoms or mental health symptoms. Sometimes people don't want to talk about it because of the shame involved. But it's really important that patients do. And if I can give one message today, it's that patients shouldn't suffer in silence. Too often we see patients with encephalitis who feel that they're just going to remain anxious or too scared to leave the house or tearful every day or having to live with terrifying experiences and that's just the way that their life will be. Well, that's not the case. Something can be done, but only if people speak up. What are the psychiatric symptoms that people might experience if they have encephalitis? Well, broadly, you can categorize these into four different areas. Cognitive symptoms or problems with thinking, uh, mood symptoms, anxiety symptoms, and the symptoms of psychosis. So of all of these, cognitive symptoms are probably the most common in encephalitis and they occur in pretty much everyone who has the disorder, whether it's encephalitis caused by an infection, such as the cold sore virus, herpes, or caused by an autoimmune problem or the body's immune system turning on itself. And problems with thinking can involve uh, problems with memory, problems with language, that's both being able to uh, produce language but also to understand other people speaking problems with understanding more generally, or problems with planning one's own activities or so-called executive function. And these cognitive problems can be extremely severe during the acute course of encephalitis, but also during the recovery phase, some of these cognitive problems can persist. And in some forms of encephalitis, such as herpes simplex encephalitis, the memory problems can persist for a very long time or for the rest of a patient's life. And these can have a huge impact on the way that they live their life. Mood symptoms. Uh, can present as low mood or depression, but also on the other hand, they can present as high mood or having a lot of energy or not being able to sleep, and that's something that we call mania or hypomania. Uh, 
And another quite common mood symptom is apathy. And this is when a patient doesn't have the motivation to do things and it can be quite distressing, particularly for carers um, and families. Anxiety symptoms are also very common and everyone has really experienced anxiety of one sort or another. People with encephalitis can have a generalized anxiety, a sort of sense of apprehension or fear uh, about almost anything, but they can suffer from post-traumatic symptoms related to some of the things that they experienced during the acute course of encephalitis. Um, and also people can experience, at least in the recovery phase, sometimes they experience a kind of um, obsessionality or a uh, recurrent thinking about particular themes or having to perform particular actions over and over again. One of the psychiatric symptoms that psychiatrists tend to worry about the most, partly because they can often be very severe, are the symptoms of psychosis. And broadly speaking, psychosis means losing touch with reality. So people can experience hallucinations uh, or seeing things, hearing things, sometimes even tasting or smelling things that aren't there or delusions, and this is when somebody believes something which isn't true, and despite all the evidence to the contrary, they believe that. They can also have uh, very unusual uh, thought processes, sometimes to the extent that when you try and talk to somebody, they don't really make sense. But the important thing to remember is that these are all symptoms, they're not diagnoses, and so these are part of encephalitis. Just because you have psychotic symptoms, for example, that doesn't mean that you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia or some other kind of psychiatric. In terms of the kind of symptoms that people will see or experience in the uh, weeks and months or even years following encephalitis, uh, mood disorders can occur and this is uh, chiefly depression but also a kind of mood instability where people's mood will change from moment to moment, sometimes to the extent that they will laugh or cry in inappropriate situations. Uh, anxiety, we spoke about a little bit before. Um, this can be a generalized anxiety or a more specific kind of anxiety. And some people have had this experience of being often hospitalized for a really long time, often in ITU, and that can be quite traumatic. And so patients can often have these traumatic memories that might need um, some support in being able to deal with those properly. Uh, personality change can be quite common after encephalitis, and particularly anger management uh, problems um, can have a real impact on patients and their family. Um, some patients who've had brain injury, including encephalitis, uh, can experience impulse control disorders. And this is when the uh, ability to sort of uh, control one's behavior becomes dysregulated to the extent that people engage in behaviors which are often distressing for them or the people around them. So uh, compulsive shopping, uh, compulsive eating sometimes, sometimes compulsive gambling, or even compulsive sexual behaviors. Psychosis as a symptom can occur. People with encephalitis are at an increased risk of psychosis, but the good news is that these symptoms are often very, very treatable. And finally, unfortunately, people with encephalitis are at increased risk of taking their own life. So it is important that we uh, monitor these patients and we offer them all the help that we possibly can. So um, one of the things that patients ask a lot about is, is misdiagnosis. Um, some people have had the experience of being diagnosed with something other than encephalitis, particularly in the early days uh, of the disorder. And this probably happens more often for autoimmune encephalitis and particularly uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis. And in fact, in the first decade of this disorder, last decade, uh, probably about three quarters of patients with this disorder were first seen by mental health services. Now, that doesn't mean that all three quarters of these patients uh, were misdiagnosed, but what it does mean is that psychiatrists are in a very important position to be able to spot these symptoms as early as possible. And certainly some of the misdiagnoses that can be made are patients being, being diagnosed with disorders such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or a first episode of psychosis. Sometimes patients get another kind of uh, misdiagnosis, which is functional neurological disorder, uh, or what's called pseudo-seizures. And this is because some of the seizures that people with encephalitis can have, they don't look exactly like the kind of seizures that people with epilepsy have. And so they get this diagnosis that perhaps the seizures are somehow psychologically motivated. This is another kind of misdiagnosis. We are working hard to raise the awareness of encephalitis amongst the psychiatric community and all the evidence suggests that the rates of misdiagnosis are probably going down but we do have a lot more work to do. But remember that just because a psychiatrist is being involved in your care that doesn't mean that you've been misdiagnosed. 
because there are lots of other roles for psychiatrists in the management and care of somebody with encephalitis. So during the acute episode of encephalitis, usually when somebody is admitted to hospital and they're being looked after by a medical team or even a neurological team, psychiatry does have a role. And this is usually in the form of liaison psychiatry or you know, neuro liaison neuropsychiatry. In America, they call it consultation liaison psychiatry. And these are psychiatrists who will come onto the wards and support the medical team in helping a patient with encephalitis with the kind of symptoms that they're having. So if a patient is having distressing anxiety or distressing psychotic symptoms, uh, there are ways to treat these. And sometimes this is medication or other approaches, more sort of behavioral approaches. And psychiatrists have an important role in supporting families and carers at this time as well. Sometimes the medications which are given to patients with encephalitis, the uh, immunological medications, can have psychiatric side effects and um, it's important that psychiatrists are uh, aware of these so that they can help manage some of these side effects as well. So we do know that in the uh, months and years following an acute episode of encephalitis, this is a period where people are at increased risk of the development of new psychiatric problems. But it's really important that patients don't suffer in silence and that they do seek help because most of these symptoms are actually really treatable and if somebody does get the correct treatment this could possibly be the difference between just getting by or struggling by with encephalitis or actually being able to live one's life with encephalitis to the greatest extent that is possible. So in the long term how can psychiatrists or neuropsychiatrists uh, help people with uh, encephalitis who have mental health problems? Well, we're able to provide symptomatic support. Again, all the kinds of symptoms that I mentioned are treatable to in, in one sense or another, and whether that involves medications to treat the symptoms or even psychological approaches. Uh, we work very closely with psychologists and psychotherapists who are able to provide a number of different uh, talking therapies that can help with some of the problems, particularly things like anxiety and depression. So cognitive behavioral therapy is probably the most common type of talking therapy, but there are other types available. We're also able to provide increased help in a crisis. And of course, if somebody becomes so unwell uh, that it might be necessary to admit them to hospital for a short while, but it's also possible to increase the level of support that somebody gets in the community. It's really important that Psychiatrists liaise very closely with neuropsychologists and with people who are helping the cognitive problems that people with encephalitis uh, experience because of course if somebody has these kind of cognitive problems, problems with their memory, problems with their thinking, this is bound to impact in one sense or another on their mental health. And patients with encephalitis often need rehabilitation and the rehabilitation will either be in an acute inpatient setting or in a uh, more long-term outpatient setting and alongside the rest of the rehabilitation team, so alongside the psychologists, uh, the physiotherapists and the occupational therapists, uh, the neuropsychiatrists have a really important role in trying to make sure that a patient's emotional well-being uh, is supported as much as possible in the stages of their rehabilitation.